By far the best thing about training, uh, for me at least, is the problem solving aspect of it. If you think about it, it's all about problem solving. It's all about, you know, having a set, set, set of circumstances and then trying to implement different methods, different ideas to try and get a better result or trying to get uh, to a goal. Um, I remember probably five, six years ago, I was watching a interview, an interview by um, of Ivan Abijayev or Ivan Abijayev, as I would say it. Um, he had an interpreter on the side. He was touring America, and this guy was basically picking his brains. And um, the question was, what are the Chinese doing right now to have such success at the Olympic weightlifting kind of uh, world? What are they doing? And even Abhijay basically went on to say that they've kind of implemented some of the Bulgarian methodologies of training every day, um, and they've just taken it to the next level. And they, they had me thinking at the time, and popped up in my brain last night when I was going through some stuff um, on the net, um, how it's all about it's all about making a change and not following, uh, coming up with a new idea that's going to have profound effects. Um, into your in your athletes and basically in, in your training as well if you're an athlete. So I touched on this before, uh, the idea of, of, of following a program versus the idea of trying to pioneer something, trying to uncover something. Um, basically, if you just follow a program that somebody else has set, the chances are there are many, many people around the world doing the same thing. Now, what's going to make you shine over the top? Sure, it could be that you are a supreme athlete, that you have genetic potential there that others don't. Um, something has to be different from the, from the cohort for you to have different results. Otherwise, if you're doing what everyone else is doing, you're gonna be like, more or less like everyone else. So my favorite bit about training is the idea of trying to work something out um, where it's just you doing that thing and it's only gonna be you having that particular result. Um, several different uh, examples pop into my head right away um, uh, in terms of sports. I'm a basketball fan, I have been for a very long time and I've watched the NBA. And as of recently, The Last Dance has come out, um, which is a documentary about the Chicago Bulls, but predominantly from Michael Jordan's perspective. And Michael Jordan had a coach called Phil Jackson. Now, Phil Jackson is basically kind of like Ivan Abijayev, um, in the same kind of group. He's one of the best coaches to ever do it. Some people say he's the greatest. One of the things that he implemented was this idea of a, a triangle offense, um, which basically works with different angles on the offensive side of the court and allows a particular set of movements by players to get players open for a free shot. Um, a similar thing in soccer, also a sport that I used to follow a lot more uh, before than now, um, was what Barcelona was doing. Barcelona was basically playing a style of football called total football. Um, a, f a fella who played soccer but then later on became a coach, Cruyff, um, he basically implemented this idea where it was a fluid type of setup on the, on the soccer pitch where players didn't have um, a very restrictive role on the pitch, rather that they could kind of interchange between different positions live while playing. So the right wing could play the right back, the right back could play midfield. And so as the play went on, they could kind of rotate and basically adapt to any situation that they were in. So during training, he would have the striker play midfield, maybe sometimes even defense and whatever. So every player had an appreciation what his teammate or colleague um, was going through um, because they've once played that position. So the, the reason why I'm telling all of this stuff is because, oh, and, and Barcelona then went on to have like this crazy dynasty period and just like Chicago Bulls and I'm sure there's other examples in sports that I'm not familiar with um, in other sports. But basically what I'm trying to get is that before something great happened, there was a spark, there was, a, there was somebody behind it, a method, a vision, um, and that's what that led the, the, the results. So what I'm trying to tell you guys is that for me, that's the biggest excitement. The idea of problem solving, the idea of coming up with something, um, the idea of creating something new and implementing it. Now, sure, you're not supposed to reinvent the wheel. You're just supposed to make the wheel a little bit more efficient in a way that's gonna stick you out from the crowd. So, 
I take all these different things that I've been exposed to um, in my time, looking at people train, looking at different things, looking at what I've gone through, and I don't just mindlessly continue on doing different programs and, and not think about what's happening. Whenever I try a certain period of training, whenever I start, uh, I start a certain, uh, or t I'm testing, I'll put in a specific variable in training, I'm always looking for the effects um, of what's happening. Not just on how, how, how the you know, much weight is on the bar, but also how I'm feeling about things, how my joints are feeling, um, what my positioning is like, and all sorts of things. So for me, you know, having this thing and staring at it every single day when I write stuff down is basically the, the biggest fun I have. The really cool side effect of all of this is that I'm exercising, I'm moving about, I'm keeping healthy, um, and for the most part, I'm, I'm feeling fantastic, right, because it's exercise. So when it comes to training, I love this stuff. I love hearing what you guys, um, what, your, what your thoughts are currently. Um, some of you guys uh, are training very different styles um, and having results. Other people are doing something different and they're having good results as well. So I think that's the fun of it. The, the, the really cool thing about this type of uh, um, sport that we're in, you know, moving barbells and training and getting stronger, um, is, the, is the idea of we're all kind of doing different things in a way. You know, some of us are doing similar things, um, but we're having different results and, you know, it's, it's there to, to, to see. Um, especially with technology now, with you know, social media, we get to see what everyone's up to. We don't have to wait for an Olympics or an international competition for us to see what the other person's doing. Back in the 70s, 80s and 90s when Ivan Abijev was, was the man, um, basically you, you could have you know, certain things come through, like through the rumor mill and all what other people are doing, but really it was only through competitions that people knew exactly what was going on. Um, oh, look at the Chinese. The Chinese have, have, you know, they're killing us by 15 kilos in total, 20 kilos in total, what are they doing? You know, what are the Americans doing? And so after the Cold War, after the, the Iron uh, Curtain fell, you know, a lot of information started going back and forth, back and forth. And now I guess we have hybrid programs between both of the worlds. You know, squat every day now is a thing, right? In the West as well, we get to, we get to read about certain things and some of their phil uh, philosophies, which is really cool because, you know, the, the, the Cold War, you know, was going on for quite a long time. And so there was a lot of, um, kind of information happening on the other side that the other, the other side didn't know about. So that's, that's the thing for me. I love this sort of stuff. I love implementing right now the 20 rep warm-up sets um, and I'm going to see how that, how that goes and what the, the effects of training is. But basically it's like a, it's like a biology or a scientific uh, problem that we have here. We want to get stronger. How do we do that? Um, and uh, yeah, it's just... I find that the coolest thing about all of this. Um, and there's no right or wrong, like, you know, there's, there's no right or wrong, all right? There's many different paths to this. It's just, what are you willing to uh, put in? Um, what's fun, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, Pavel Tatsulin had an interview a while back and he said, um, he was asked, you know, if some of those programs, you know, that he's talking about, like the Eastern philosophies, um, if they're so good, why do people stop doing them? And, and he made a comment along the lines of, it's because people go bored and wanted something new. Let that sink in for a bit. So they know that particular methodology worked, but they got bored of it. They just, they couldn't put up with, with the work. They wanted to try something better. See, see, see what's happening here? You know, they had, a, they had a, suc a successful recipe, but they wanted something better. So they changed something and they deviated away from a successful program in the hope of finding something even better. That's cool. It's like a, a human evolution requirement. You know, we're always seeking something better. We're always trying to improve. Um, and so I'm guessing even people out there at the top levels, they're not satisfied with the status quo. They want to get better. They want to continue to, to, to move knowledge forward and excel and excel. I think that's the coolest thing. All right, now let me do some weightlifting. So once again, it's five in the morning, blah, 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 blah. It's cold. Although I feel like today is less cold than, than yesterday. But anyway, let me bust out some of these 20 rep sets and uh, we'll go from there.
the really cool with stuff like this is that as we progress, records are continuously falling. And uh, there could be many reasons for that. Better athletes, better, you know, sports science, you know, better recovery, better drugs, you know, more athletes to choose from. You know, people, more and more people are doing a particular sport. You know, the thing with some of these big sports like, you know, soccer, basketball, American football, is that when so many people are playing a particular sport, you know, and when there's so much money in the sport, you're gonna get better athletes to the sport. You know, genetic marvels. You know, I've always said that LeBron James could have picked any sport and would have been one of the greatest of all time. You know, just think about if he played volleyball. He's, a, he's so athletic, he could have done really, really well. If he played American football, imagine that, imagine that dude. He's just a, he's just a gifted athlete. Um, so, you know, performances are getting better and better. Yeah, they're sure. There's some things that are changing in terms of rules, like in the NBA, the game's completely different. You know, back in the 80s and the 90s, the game was a lot different than what it is now. Now there's more possessions per game. So the stats seem a bit inflated. So, you, you know, you have to adjust for certain things to really compare performances and whatnot. Um, but even when you distill all of that, the precipitate um, is that I think generally the, the play is getting better. The players are getting better. Um, and so these players, you know, they're going to disseminate their information to the following generation. And so, you know, who's the next LeBron James or Michael Jordan? You know, um, how are they going to be better? Is that next person going to learn from Le LeBron's mistakes like LeBron learned from Jordan's mistakes? So that's the exciting thing, right? Um, so in a way, you know, we need to learn from the generation before us, but we can't just follow exactly to a T because even if we do exactly everything like, like they did, we might get their result. Do you know what I mean? Like, but that, that's not going to get you, you know, the super status of, or oh, this guy's the greatest of all time. You need to take that information and then improve on that information, on those training routines somehow you know, pick it apart, realize where they potentially could have gone wrong, put your thing into it, and then excel that previous lifter, or any sport, really. That's the trick. So when I have a difficulty in following programs to a T, um, you can take different things, like I've said, you can take different things from, from different programs and implement it, or you can take two programs and merge them together somehow, and but you need to understand the essence of each program, what each program is trying to do. So it takes a lot of experience, it takes a lot of knowledge of, uh, about what's going on. I'm certainly not an expert, um, but in my you know, short years of training, I've realized certain aspects of certain philosophies and I'm like, you know, I'm getting some sort of idea of what's happening. And the best thing, you can test it live. Like you can test this stuff completely as you're going along. You can, you can test it, right? So, but you just have to give it enough time. So, you know, don't do a program for two weeks and then jump off and say it's bullshit. Give it a good go. Run for a little bit. See if it's actually working or not and how you feel. And make sure you put it in the log and, and actually how you feel and, and discuss it and whatnot. So, so, you can learn from it. You know, you know they say if you don't measure, so if, if, if you don't record, you can't measure. If you can't measure, you can't, you can't progress. You can't do anything with it.
This is where I get short of breath every single time. And the 40 kilos times 20. Oh. Nothing wakes you up like shortness of breath. <laughs> crisp air going in. Really crisp air this morning, but it's not too cold. Um, but it's really fresh air. Only had about five hours of sleep. Yesterday I worked again 12 hours. So five hours of sleep. Five and a half. But I've got a couple of days off after this, so I'll have time to recover, sleep in a bit, catch up on sleep. You know, we talk about variables of training all the time. You know, intensity, volume, how many reps, how many sets, frequency. Um, lack of sleep is also a parameter that you can manipulate, right? You know, there's so many parameters, so many things going on. Every single morning that I do this, I feel a quad pump. For somebody that's struggled to feel that, you know, pump, it's a beautiful thing, man. Love it. I'm used to feeling the adductors flare up, the glutes kind of flare up and cramp up, but the quads are rarely, rarely with lower repetitions for me. So, kind of like teaching the body to use those big muscles at the front again. That's the thing about doing lower repetitions all the time. I've mentioned it before, but your body finds the, the, um, the path of least resistance. This way it's heavy, so let's, let's recruit the stuff we really know and trust in the body to get this weight up. Weakness to start to happen because more and more you're using the stuff that's really good. You lower the weight a little bit, you put the reps up a little bit, all of a sudden the path of least resistance is not required because even the path that's mildly more harder is still doable. And so the body tries to use some other stuff. And then you kind of get a flattening of those imbalances. She's really cool. All right, 60 for 20.
Nowadays, when I, when I look at sports, when I follow the NBA, when I follow some of these more successful teams, successful kind of uh, clubs, I always look for, you know, the people behind all the glamour and the foreground, and I always look for that. You know, and you'll find that the people responsible for the things that are happening, there's always some really clever guy behind the scenes. You know, there's always a mastermind behind all of this. You know, the guy who came up with the idea, the solution. Um, so whenever you see someone like performing really well, um, think, think to yourself, who's in the background? You know, who's um, responsible for this? You know, obviously, like Jordan said, it's not the management that wins the championships, wins the ball games. It's the players on the court. But one thing's for sure is that Michael Jordan would have never won without Scottie Pippen. He probably would have never won without Rodman, without Horace Grant and some of these other guys, supporting cast. And certainly we've seen a lot of NBA players and a lot of superstars in the past who have been legends of the game, you know, absolute legends of the game, arguably top five, top ten, but put in really bad circumstances, really bad um, situations where the, the winning formula is not there and the, the best years of their life, their careers have been wasted. So it has to be a perfect storm. You have to have a supreme athlete like Jordan, like LeBron, like Kobe Bryant, supreme athlete with a supreme coach on the other end. Somebody that can harness that ability and, and use it. Um, so I'm always thinking about who's responsible. You know, Ivan Ibajev was highlighted years, years, years later when his athletes started winning. And it became apparent that there was a pattern behind all of this winning. It's not that it was just this freak athlete. It wasn't just one freak athlete or two or three or five. It worked out that these guys pumping these guys out like a factory. These guys onto something. You know, he brought highlight. He brought a lot onto himself because of the success. People started paying attention. People started studying the logbooks. And they realized he was doing something that no one else was doing at the time. You know, imagine that. Imagine you're him and the thought comes to your mind that you're going to have your, 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 your players, your, your athletes squat three times a day. You know, snatch, clean and jerk three times a day. I mean, think about that. Like, that is so far away from what the normal was at the time. The people went, man, this, this guy's crazy. You know? This guy's killing these guys. Then you could say, yo, oh, yeah, it's, it's the drugs, man. It's the drugs. Screw that. Everyone's on drugs. That's my assumption. Everyone's on drugs. You think the Americans weren't on drugs? Or the Russians or whoever else was at the top at the time? Everyone's on drugs. So... The anxiety of, of implementing something um, can be daunting, especially when it's so drastic. Go for it. Experiment. Don't be a pussy. Make the change. Do it. Own it. And that's it. It's usually the people that are scared, the ones that are, not, are never going to do anything. It's the people that are, oh no, it's too difficult. That's just loser talk. The guys who are after winning and who are after doing crazy shit, you know, they, 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 they're up to doing crazy shit. And they try different things. You never know, you might be surprised. You might find that secret sauce. Once you find that secret sauce, everyone's gonna be like, oh, you're amazing. Uh, but at the time, no one's gonna believe you. So, as long as you have some sort of rationale for your actions, rationale for your thinking, and it makes sense to you, that is all you need, man. Just go ahead, do your thing, and that's it. Um, whatever it is, you know, he, he, he got his athlete to score three times a, a day. That was his thing. Now, do you, have your, do you now score six times a, a day? You know, it doesn't have to be that linear of a thought. It could be anything, man. Just pay attention to what you're doing. Switch your mind on. They just meaninglessly go through motions. Actually think about the process of what you're doing. And thinking about what, you, what you're trying to achieve. I mean, we don't have to be professors of science. We don't have to do... It's just trial and error, man. It's just trial and error. Measure everything out and then feed it back to yourself and be like, what if I change this? And if you keep changing variables and control all the others, eventually you're going to get a ha-ha moment where, oh, okay, 
That shit's working. Let's put that and change something else and see if we can double the effect. Things of that nature. All right, 80. The moral of the story is to be brave. Be brave, man. Don't be a pussy about it. Even if somebody criticizes you for it, make a plan, stick with it, own it. The bottom line is, is that uh, you need to be doing something that no one else is doing in order for you to be the best. Think of it that way. You need to do something that no one else is doing to be the best. You need to separate yourself from the crowd somehow. Now, how we do that is the million dollar question. That's the thing. You know, if, if I was squatting 300 kilos, people would have would say, "Okay, he's onto something." When you're squatting 180 kilos, people are less convinced. So, in order you to, for for you to stick out of the crowd, you need to have something to show for it. It's not just good enough. Oh yeah, I'm doing something really different. Oh look at that, I'm squatting every day. Oh look at that, I'm doing every lift every day, look at that. There needs to be results attached to it. Um, so don't just look for the wow factor. Wow, look what he's doing. He's getting, you know, everyone's attention. Is it impressive? Is it, am I doing something that's, that's getting results, basically? Those are the things that go, wow. All right, that's 100 for five. We'll do 120 for one. 140 for one, as the routine goes. We'll see where we're at. I don't feel the sharpest this morning. I don't feel the, you know, the most explosive, but 
cool get there. Um, just focusing on technique, focusing on staying upright, focusing on sticking my collarbones out, chin back. These are the weights now that challenge my upper back. I feel like the leg power today is just, can I keep the chest up? Um, we'll see, I guess. I think tomorrow, the next day, I'm gonna do some back squatting. It's been a while. It's just when I, when I have these day shifts, 12 hour shifts, I, I like to do front squats. It's easy to recover from with lack of sleep on top of it, you know. So just kind of like my maintenance dose of squatting. All right, 140. Alright, I'm happy 140, we'll pull 150. So it goes. The shoulder is still a bit of a trouble to me. But it's all I feel like it's getting better. It's getting better. It's this. Not just a passive, but like, you know, forced external rotation is bothering me. Uh, it's not like a, a, a pain, it's kinda of like it's kinda of like an achy pain. It's not like sharp or feels, you know. Over the years, man, like if you've been training for a while, I'm sure you guys will agree. You kind of learn the difference between pains, as, as funny as that sounds. Like you know when you're fucked up. Like you, you know where, when things don't feel right. This feels kind of like a, kind of like a, you know, you're stretching too far pain, but it's not like a ripping sharp pain. It's not like a nervous pain. It's kind of like, yeah, the muscles end range is there. And you're stretching, kind of like when you feel the hamstring stretch. That's what it feels like. Then you add a bit of weight on it, and it's like an assisted, weighted stretch. That's what it feels like. But it's getting better. The pull-ups help as well. So tomorrow I'll do pull-ups. I haven't done pull-ups since the first time I did them, like four days ago now. No time, but. All right, let's get 150 up and see how this moves.
that's all man I could probably get 160 but not happy with how that moved he was folding me over a little bit so we'll call it there guys catch you tomorrow see ya